Welcome everybody to episode 133 of the Startup Show. Today we are here at Trust Square in Zurich and I'm talking to the CEO and co-founder of Vision End. Her name is Lydia and I'm very excited to talk about blockchain investments, talking about regulations of crypto assets, but also about when you should start with programming. Make sure to stay tuned. Welcome to episode 133 of the Startup Show. Today we are here in Zurich at Trust Square and we are talking to the CEO and co-founder of Vision and Lydia. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric, for having me. It's such a pleasure uh, to have you and I'm really excited about the topic. I'm really excited about you as a person because I think like, you know, the staggering um, career you've done in the last few years, it's pretty impressive um, where you worked um, and what you did and what you achieved so far. So let's first um, get a sense of who you are and maybe introduce yourself to my audience. Sure, happy to do so. Um, my name is Lydia. Um, I've always worked at the intersection of finance and technology. Uh, I did a PhD in finance, so my, my education is really more finance-based but always loved the technology part. So yes. I did a lot of programming myself uh, during the studies, but also later on during my work. I started working in the financial industry after my studies, then ended up in a company, a really small company, a spin-off of the University of St. Gallen, mm -hmm. uh, which was a great experience, having like this first experience within a small company um, and really trying to build something from scratch. And that's also what brought me uh, here to Vision and uh, where we decided to um, start our own venture. Sure. But I mean, Vision and you have, that's like what you're doing right now, you're focused but then there is Jamie and I, then there is um, a short internship at JP Morgan, and there is so many other things, a PhD in St. Gallen, and you now said also you did your uh, programming during the University of St. Gallen, which is kind of like unexpected. You know, many people at the University of St. Gallen, they're more focused on business. So how was that for you? Or like, how did you bring all of this together now to start Vision End? For me, it's a question of, about uh, what you really like to do and then could never decide whether I should do um, more computer science or, or business. I love yes. both of it. Um, so I decided to do uh, the business part, but do the computer science programming more for my personal um, pleasure yeah. in that sense. I did my studies at the University of St. Gallen. Uh, you did a lot of internships. So I worked for banks. I, I got some uh, know-how for the financial market sector. Mm -hmm. And I then decided to broaden that know-how uh, within a PhD, which allowed me to really focus on, on certain topics mm -hmm. um, specifically. It also allowed me to combine my skills in the in the programming side because I could um, implement financial models in programming languages that I knew right. and I could develop my skills further sure. there. And so those parts of uh, having the financial market know-how and this expertise in, in, in the technology um, ended up um, having its best part in, in uh, Algofin, that's a spin-off of the University in St. Gallen, where we really developed financial models for corporates and that was a great experience yeah. and it also brought me where we are now where it's again at the intersection of finance and technology um, with vision and we are bringing traditional investors to this new blockchain world mm -hmm. and uh, it helps me uh, and my co-founders uh, having those know-how in those both sectors mm -hmm. uh, finance as well as technology to really talk on one side the language of the traditional investors but on the other side in really understand where we are investing in mm -hmm. so but let's let's start again like for, from the pitch about like what yeah. vision and does so we get it like in a, in a full spectrum and understand what it is so maybe and uh, give us let's say a minute and a half about like exactly what vision and is I love to do that um, so <laughs> vision and is basically an investment house which focuses on blockchain investments we uh, really believe in the blockchain technology and and we are convinced that that's going to revolutionize many markets uh, mm -hmm. around the world However, investing into the blockchain space is really difficult. It's time consuming. Whoever opened the wallet uh, once or ha had to handle private keys in the crypto space uh, knows uh, what I'm talking about. It also requires a lot of research. Uh, you have a lot of blockchain projects in the crypto space and outside of the crypto space, and you need someone evaluating those projects and really knowing where they're investing in. So with Vision and we decided to help traditional investors mm -hmm. enter this amazing market of blockchain technologies and uh, provide them with the research and the tools to invest easily within that market. Sure. I mean, I was very excited for that one question. Um, what's your vision with Vision uh, End? <laughs> <laughs> um. it's, a, it's a great question. The, the, the vision is, is big. Uh, that's why it's also in the name. Uh, it's also, in a sense, open-ended. That's why yeah. it's called Vision End without anything after the end. <laughs> in the sense that we are trying to build uh, really a a leading player, not just in Switzerland, but um, 
on a global basis mm -hmm. within uh, the blockchain investment space. And that means on one side, really providing access to those traditional investors with this new uh, world of technology. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, also providing a lot of know-how and spreading that know-how on the blockchain mm -hmm. space, which we are doing with our research. You briefly mentioned the, the time consumption it takes to invest. What are, let's say, the biggest um, technological um, hurd hurdles or like challenges for investors to get into that sector right now? I'd summarize it in uh, three points. Um, one is just uh, it's time consuming. You have to uh, open a lot of uh, wallets. You have to um, handle private keys. Um, you're um, working in a field that you haven't uh, known before as a mm -hmm. traditional investor. And uh, it's really time consuming to read into um, that new field. The other challenge is security. Suddenly you are responsible for your own assets. Up to now you had a bank that's storing your assets. Mm -hmm. With investing in the blockchain and the crypto space, uh, the issue is that you can uh, store your assets by yourself. That's a good thing on one side, but on the other side uh, you have to put a, a huge effort on security. And we are helping our clients uh, on this security issue that we are working together with banks who are mm -hmm. able to provide that security for us and our clients. The third thing that's uh, a big challenge when investing in a space is uh, the know-how. You need a really deep technical understanding for evaluating all those projects. Those blockchain projects have different technologies. It's not just one blockchain technology and once you got that, you yes. get all the projects. They are really different. And you need someone looking at those projects, understanding the technologies, uh, understanding the, the teams behind and whether they are able to execute on what mm -hmm. they're promising. Uh, and that challenge is one thing we are helping to, to try to solve for our sure. investors. Sure. So when you look at, let's say, the blockchain now, um, you know, there's a whole different new space. And now getting into like asset management within that space is probably a totally new world. Um, how do you see that when you speak to clients? Um, what are, let's say, the biggest like, challenges these people have in bringing their money or institutional money into asset management of blockchain um, investments? The, the biggest question is always um, around the, the topic blockchain versus crypto assets. When people hear about what you're doing, they always think we do Bitcoin investments. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin is one cryptocurrency. It's a really interesting cryptocurrency, but it's one only. You have a lot of other crypto assets which do not have anything to do with, with a currency use case, um, but are still in this crypto space. The biggest um, effort we are doing uh, when meeting new clients is to do a lot of education on that topic and describing how does blockchain relate to crypto assets and really illustrating that blockchain is the great technology and that's where we want to get access to and mm -hmm. give access for our investors to that. But Crypto asset is one possible way to invest into the blockchain mm -hmm. space. And that shouldn't be neglected because it's a it's a really beautiful space to invest in. Sure, sure. Um, but like when you say like asset management, are you trying to look, let's say, for, for the private clients or are you looking more into institutional? It's both. On the private side, it's more wealthy individuals. It's not retail clients so yeah. much. And on the institutional side, it's mainly family offices currently and other traditional asset managers. Mm -hmm. You can imagine in Switzerland, there are around 2,500 traditional asset managers. They all get approached by their clients. Oh, should I invest in Bitcoin? Should I do something else? And usually those traditional asset managers do not have the know-how in yes. the field. So we are uh, working together with those traditional asset managers, are providing them with the, the know-how yeah. we have, as well as with the financial tools that they can use directly to invest in. Sure. One of the things that I, let, I read a couple of your reports, um, yeah. and you have some interesting statistics, maybe you can share some of them with us, you know, like say like, the key findings you had uh, thanks to this big data analytics and what you found. So one of the first key questions we addressed in our research was what are the use cases? Is it just currencies or what else is out there? Yep. And you see that starting 2009 uh, with Bitcoin and then 2011, 2012, you see um, mostly currency use cases having been launched as blockchain mm -hmm. topics. But starting around 2014, 2015, and now in 2016, 17, anyway, you see a lot of those projects being launched, which you don't have to do anything with currency. Those projects are really interesting as a diversification approach. So you can invest in currency. That's one use case of blockchain technology. But there are so many other use cases. And in the last couple of years, you see many of those projects being launched. And um, they all fall into the bucket cryptocurrency in yeah. that sense. But they are not currencies. Okay. Looking at this market in detail and illustrating that uh, in, in graphs and, and showing that to our clients helped a lot. So that's sure. one of the main findings. That's Just like in a side note, what are, let's say, some use cases that you would say that are not currencies? 
So one important use case is the whole developer tool space. Mm -hmm. And Ethereum as second biggest uh, cryptocurrency uh, falls under that space. And what those developer tools are doing is basically providing you with a, a platform, in that sense, a, a blockchain technology platform, which other developers can use to build their applications on top of it. So it's more comparable to a, a, an Apple App Store where you have a, a platform yes. um, where developers can build on top of it. You now have a blockchain uh, platform where uh, developers build on top of it. It's a, a really interesting use case. Um, the workings and the business model are totally different to an Apple App Store, I have to say. Um, but still, it's not the currency which is the main use case. Ethereum doesn't try to replace a Swiss franc or a US dollar yes. or gold. It's really uh, more of a, of a tech case. Right. We also see a lot of non-financial applications now coming up, which we think are really interesting. It can be in the pharma space or uh, in the logistics space, for example. Yeah, logistics, I heard a lot about the yeah. end-to-end. Exactly. You see exactly where it's come, yeah. which is probably similar to pharma. Research is one part, but you know, asset management is probably the main part. Um, how do you value um, these these blockchain investments. I think yeah. I can imagine, I mean, I see how hard it is for startup investors to value a certain startup, and I guess multiples are very different in the blockchain space. What's your take on that? That's the million dollar question, <laughs> yes. I'd say. Yeah. Um, you have really to look at how the project is structured. You have classical uh, currencies like Bitcoin. There, you cannot use a traditional discounted cash flow models because there is no cash flow yes. with Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, you have to compare more with, with other assets in that space. You can compare to the gold market and make comparisons there. But in the end, the price of Bitcoin is really only dependent on the demand for it. Mm -hmm. It's not an underlying technology that has an intrinsic value. It's really only the demand for Bitcoin. As with gold, it's just the demand for gold that drives its price, right? Yeah. So you have um, valuation models for the currency space. And then you have valuation models for uh, all those other projects out there, and there it really depends what it is. We see more and more um, so-called security tokens being launched. That means that you um, issue your own crypto asset, which is somehow linked to your equity, mm -hmm. for example, or it's linked to an underlying asset. Such as real estate or For example, a car you can link or... it to real estate or you can link it to your own equity okay. as a company. And there you can really also apply traditional valuation models. So if it's linked to equity of a company, you can start using discount cash flow models again uh, on those companies. You have to put an effort on, on, on looking how, how is the crypto asset linked to the company. If it's similar to equity, then you can also use comparable models. Blockchain is definitely one of the buzzwords at the moment, yeah. especially going to investors. Uh, the other one is AI, which I guess yeah. you bring uh, with you from uh, Jamie and I. Yeah. And one of the questions that um, uh, we received through uh, our research is like, if you can bring in um, some kind of, let's say, AI into decision-making of your blockchain investments? Yeah, that's a question we hear a lot. There is definitely an uh, opportunity there to do mm -hmm. something because it hasn't been really done yet, as far as I know. In my opinion, we first have to understand the underlying market in more detail. So you can apply AI and all those technologies once you understand the basics. Yes. We do not yet even have valuation models for a lot of those <laughs> coins yet, right? And those valuation models are more about finding mathematical models, uh, finding business models, and then how you can uh, make valuations for those. And once you have that, then you can apply AI algorithms on top for the selection. I'd see it more as a, as a second step, but it's yes. definitely one that we have on, on our uh, on our screens. On our right? radar, yeah. very good. Um, you know, uh, our friends at uh, Crypto Fund, uh, they asked also about like uh, what's your take on the regulations, um, upcoming regulations and how you see that, let's say, specifically um, in Switzerland, but also like more on a global scale. Yeah, I think regulations are, for us, a really important part of the whole uh, development of the industry. Mm -hmm. It's already regulated now. That's what people forget a lot. Yeah, we have the regulations. Over there, yeah. The SEC. Yeah, and you have existing regulations for uh, financial markets. They are applicable um, the same way as they are <laughs> yes. uh, for traditional assets. They're applicable for uh, crypto assets as well. Sometimes what's, what could be required a bit more is a clear statement on certain questions, which um, where you cannot apply those traditional laws directly. Mm -hmm. And because there are new questions that are arising now that haven't um, been uh, posed before. But I believe in Switzerland, um, with FINMA, we have a really good approach towards that. So FINMA is really going slowly in the sense that they first really want to understand the whole market and then they're going to make a statement on how it's uh, regulated. Mm -hmm. You have other regulatory bodies in the international perspective. When they don't understand something, they forbid <laughs> and FINMA is definitely not taking that approach, and, and we believe that's, that's going to be really important for the Swiss market in that field. Right. Um, one of the questions is, uh, do you expect government-issued cryptocurrencies to take over the payment function? So government-issued cryptocurrencies, it's a, for me it's a question whether that's even possible in a, in a conceptual way. Because 
on the uh, global scale, I assume. It, it, <laughs> uh, do you mean whether cryptocurrencies are overtaking tradition? Uh, like no, Swiss no. Bank if, if if there's if let's a, say the uh, the Swiss a, National Bank issues is, is, is issues a cryptocurrency. So the inherent value of cryptocurrencies is that it's decentralized. Yes. If a Swiss National Bank wants to issue a cryptocurrency, they would have to make it um, really decentralized. Uh, I believe whether the Swiss National Bank, nor the, the US uh, Fed, uh, nor anyone uh, who wants to control the money supply <laughs> will be willing to do a decentralized uh, cryptocurrency in, in the, in the sure. real sense. So I believe there's going to be digital currencies, definitely. The Swiss National Bank and other um, countries might use the blockchain technology for issuing money. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe it's not going to be real cryptocurrencies as we know it for Bitcoin, for example. Much rather. Um, it's rather a, a, a digitalized way of, of national taxes. currencies. Yeah. <laughs> because they always want to have the, the last word in it. They're yes. never going to give that away, I believe. Yes, otherwise yeah. they're redundant. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, last one for this, uh, Crypto Valley. Um, you know, big hype, especially when you live in Switzerland. Outside of Switzerland, you hear less about it. Um, what, what's your take on, on, on the Crypto Valley? Um, what's your experience? We are based in the Crypto uh, Valley labs as well. So yeah. for us, the Crypto Valley is a really important place to meet other players in the scene. Yeah. I think it's also really important for the Swiss startup uh, scene in the blockchain space because they are really um, pulling the strings in bringing the right people people into the, the space. Mm -hmm. And they're especially Lakeside Partners and Inacta and the guys behind there, they're doing a big and a really great job in, in, in bringing interesting people uh, to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And the brand Crypto Valley uh, really works in that sense. So right. um, Some people say it's called Crypto Nation now, Crypto Valley, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think there's still a, a bit to go till we are a Crypto Nation, but yeah. it's definitely on sure, the right path. Sure, too. sure. Um, but how is the atmosphere like in between each other. Um. Trust Square here, as well as in the crypt in yes. crypto in general, it's a, a really um, say collaborative atmosphere. Yeah. It's a, it's a new a new world that everyone uh, works on on great ideas. Mm -hmm. Really smart people working here. <laughs> everyone wants to contribute, and it's a really a great place to be to re to start a business in that space. Who is your role model in the blockchain space? It's or startup to, space. Yeah. I also say startup. There are a lot of players in the in the Swiss blockchain space which I really believe have have great know-how in what they're doing. For example, uh, Lucas from the Bitcoin Association. I think he's he's a great guy and, yes. and he really knows what he's doing and it's really inspiring uh, listening to him and, and his ideas. There are a lot of uh, players in the Swiss market. Uh, which are, are smart in the biggest sense and really trying to revolutionize this this world. Mm -hmm. um, my role models personally are more on the on the broader uh, sense. I, I don't really have them in the financial markets. <laughs> For me, it's more um, people like Roger Feder who, who managed to do something amazing with talent on one side, but, but also with controlling their minds and really putting their minds uh, where their talent is, uh, but still um, being grounded and yes. not um, being, uh, with all that hype, still being yeah. be, being uh, a normal person, <laughs> sense, uh, as far as that, okay. Or people, uh, I think one of my favorite role models is, is usually my mom, um, <laughs> because uh, she, she built her own business and managed to do that uh, in a time where it, it wasn't that normal uh, yes. to do that. And so she, she would be my main role model. If you and know. having family, I guess, yeah. at the same time. <laughs> yeah. um, if you can remember back, how did you get your first paying client? With a lot of uh, different meetings. So we met, <laughs> uh, we met many people and talking about the blockchain uh, space. And some of them are interested really quickly. Yeah. Uh, some take some more time. Um, but the first paying clients are th were those that, that we got right away, that uh, we entered Same. the meeting and then they loved the idea and just uh, committed to it. Sure. Um, what inspired you for entrepreneurship? I'd say on one side, my parents who had their own businesses. Um, yeah. So seeing how it's possible to, to build something from scratch was really amazing for me. And um, I started in the corporate world and um, I like doing that. Um, I can imagine going back at some point, maybe. <laughs> for now, um, seeing like how new projects can grow out of nothing uh, is amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, yes. <laughs> you probably understand like, yes. seeing all those different startups. Um, what are some tips for balancing work and life? <laughs> If you know them, tell me. <laughs> um, Go abroad to nice places, I yeah, guess. <laughs> that, that's uh, one idea. Um, I do sports. Yeah. Running, keeping uh, your friends and family with you. So um, 
meaning like go for uh, go for those dinners uh, don't cancel on them and, and really keep that alive yes last one the most important character in an entrepreneur it's definitely passion yeah I mean, there's no right and wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking what, what, what keeps us going because yes. you, you have highs and lows yes. um, and every startup person knows that. And you have really high highs and really uh, deep lows. Yes. And so you need passion uh, to bring you through that. You need to uh, be able to stick with your ideas. Don't change them just when, like, when you hit the challenge or something like yeah. that. So people like really sticking to their ideas, believing mm -hmm. in them and executing. The last part of my show is always about you giving some expert advice to my audience who are, you know, mainly as, as, or a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs, a lot of uh, students who are considering maybe becoming an entrepreneur. So um, wherever you feel uh, being an expert, maybe you can share some wisdom and leave a legacy for the future generations on the internet. I think really important as entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, but also as uh, our generation, which are going to live in a world driven by technology, but didn't really have tech education when mm -hmm. we were kids. So we didn't learn uh, programming in school as the kids today do. Yeah. So we are um, young building companies, um, but uh, most of us don't really know about the tech. Yes. So I'd advise everyone really start programming on a small scale and no one has to be able to program an app. But if you just, start with an easy, easy programming task and then you get right away a feel for that. And then when you're building companies or even within a corporate job, it will help you in the future because it's going to be tech driven all the way. Sure. Good. Elia, thank you so much for thank being on the show today. I uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank Great you very time. much, everybody who stayed all the way till the end of this video. Make sure to stay a few more seconds uh, to see who is up next week and I'll see you there. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Ralph Schoenbach. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Invoit. I hope you join us on Monday and subscribe to this channel.